Well, good morning, uh, everybody. I'd like to uh, welcome you. I'd like to welcome you to this uh, event, very special event. It's once per year. Uh, it's hosted by AI Sweden in uh, our Gothenburg facility. Uh, I'd like to first of all um, extend a special welcome to our advisory board for the AI labs. Uh, they are here, except one person who ended up getting sick with the flu. That's Daria Isaksson, who could not make it today. But in the room in here amongst us, we have Dr. Giuseppe Borghi from head of the FeeLab division at the European Space Agency. We have uh, Dr. Yilblad from Recorded Future and AI Sweden. Uh, Dr. and Professor Jose Marie Griffiths, who is the president of Dakota State University. And Eva skog who is the rear admiral and chief of the Swedish Navy. Uh, and Stefan Jeske uh, from Volvo Group who is the Senior Vice President of Enterprise IT Security, and Mats Moberg, who has been our Senior Advisor for many years, formerly at Volvo Cars, and Dr. Brian Reimer from MIT, who will also give a keynote here in a short while. So they've been working with us all morning, giving us feedback and suggestions for new directions for what we do here at AI Sweden. It's a great pleasure to have you all here. And of course, everybody else who is here, taking the time to come to Gothenburg and meet us and the experts on site and of course everybody who is online following is us from cyberspace we hope to make this an interesting uh, morning uh, or lunch um, i will uh, be very brief to be able to hand it to dr reimer just a quick introduction for those of you who don't know what ai sweden is is that we were formed now five years ago as a national center for applied ai with the mission to accelerate the application of AI in Sweden. We are a neutral nonprofit and broadly funded organization. So we have funding from private sector, from public sector and from, from government. And they are also very well represented and present here at AI Sweden at one of our nodes, whether it be here in Göteborg, Stockholm, Linköping, Lund, Luleå, Örebro and some other sites. Currently, we have about 120 different member companies. You can see them here. Um, the bottom right are the large corporations. Top right is academic institutes in Sweden. Top left, public sector. And bottom left is the smaller AI-centric companies. Our organization at AI Sweden has recently been updated. So we have now three main components. It's AI Labs, where we do our infrastructure and data and technology development. We have AI Adoption, which is uh, our uh, group that is working on bringing AI to value in organizations, whether it's private or public. Also doing training and, and uh, education. And then not least, ecosystems. That makes sure that what you saw in the previous slide, that we can maximize the benefit for all our partners of being a partner, working together, but also working with their international relations and, and government relations to reach out and to reach in to make sure we can maximize the benefit for everybody here. At AI Sweden, we try to explain our way of working by this image. It's a place where partners from this ecosystem identify a common interest, get together, quickly start up work here at AI Sweden, share the results among themselves, and also share the results with all the other partners who are in our ecosystem. So it is a speed game. It's about getting going really fast and finding people or companies or organizations that you would normally not work with. And this way, exploring and learning and applying AI to new problems. That is a brief introduction to what is AI Sweden. And I'm not going to spend more time on that. There is obviously material on the web and so forth if you want to dive more into it or come and talk to us. So instead, I'm going to introduce our advisory board member who's been with us also for many years now, Dr. Brian Reimer, who is a co-director of the Advanced Vehicle uh, Technology Consortium at MIT. He will talk today on how to pick the right screwdriver and give us perspectives on the future of human-centered AI. So with that, Brian, please Thank take you the stage. So hopefully you can hear me. Okay, great. 
So the last time I think I spoke at AI Sweden, um, a good colleague of mine, Ola Bernstrom, um, had me uh, speak about five years ago at a kickoff event for AI Sweden. And I talked about automated vehicles, which is, is a large part of my work in general. And I urge everybody in the room to go back and look at the text of that talk, which I believe still is online, and my key TEDx talk from about five years ago on the trajectory of automation um, and how it is impacting us. Because I think it has a lot of synergies to the AI side. The screwdriver here is just one of many tools we all have in our home. And how do we pick the right tools for the right problems? And how do we think about the future a little bit differently here? So first things first, we're all a, bright, a bunch of bright people in this room. It's 11 a.m. or just after here in Sweden. It's 5 a.m. in my brain back on the East Coast in the US. So class participation is 85%. What is artificial intelligence? Anybody? Come on. Maths? Math? Mm -hmm. I like that. Annika, how did it make computers do what they do in movies? Anybody else? I like that one. So we can look all over the web. Everybody can go around and try to find a definition, but here's one I love. The definition it refers to the simulation of human intelligence by machines. Okay, we understand that. But it's an ever-changing definition because between the moment that I started my talk today and right now, our definition of what machines can do has changed. Technology to stimulate humans, simulate humans better. And moment by moment, the capabilities of AI are being reinvented. When we talk to experts, we can begin to think about how AI means different things to different people. So we have a tendency to talk past each other all the time. Researchers talk of it one way. Technology developers, another way. Politicians, investors, consumers, all see the world differently here. So we have a tendency to talk by each other. The research community, can I separate cats and dogs better? The basics of computer vision. Developers, how can I make money with this application? Politicians, what are the risks to my society? Investors, market potential. How much can the value of Tesla go up or any other way? Go down. Short the stock these days. Consumers want things to do things for them. And day by day, there's always a new topic related to AI in the news. Some cool new innovation, some limiting factor, some risk. We can't keep track of it. There is not an individual in this room who can keep track of the speed and the complexity in which the AI innovation space is moving. So let's use a study point here, a part that's near and dear to my heart. Automated vehicles were predicated on the advancements of AI. Just about a decade ago, quite frankly, the DARPA Urban Challenge was a little over a decade ago now. Many folks out there believed that we were going to solve AV-related topics overnight. I'd be able to take a fully autonomous robot from the front of the Ericsson building here to the airport. Well, that hasn't come to fruition, and nor do I expect in, in, in my lifetime that truly to come to, to fruit. Many different organizations out there are working on different aspects of this. Whether it's operational complexities between the US and China that differ. Limitations on sensing and compute that we know are, are problematic in a revolution to that level of autonomy, the safety case that we need to think about. The overhype and under delivery of these products, Tesla's gonna develop a robo taxi and it's going to be released on August 8th. Anybody waiting to see how this works? When we think about different perspectives and different beliefs, human capital is going to remain a coveted commodity in how we do things, even with the most advances that we can think of in automation and AI. How do we build systems that move to produce revenue that allows for more innovation and more investment over time. 
It's not to say that research isn't important, but we can't invest in research forever. So we think about automation here. We now have AI skeptics and AI experts saying, hmm, maybe this won't happen. The Association of Computing Machinery, again, those folks that, 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 that really think about the Turing test, published a piece two weeks ago. Maybe automated vehicles without humans' active attention aren't possible. Piece in Auto News, $204 billion poured into automated vehicles, as quoted by McKinsey. And what have fatality curves done globally? They're about stagnant. My best, and I, I want to read this to you, is the quote from Rodney Brooks earlier this year. For those of you who don't know who Rodney is, Rodney is a preeminent computer scientist, roboticist. He ran the MIT um, lab, computer science lab, founded a few companies, including iRobot. I spent my whole professional life developing robots, and my companies have built more of them than anyone else. And this is true. But I can assure you that I, as a driver in San Francisco during the day, I was getting pretty frustrated with driverless crews and Waymo vehicles doing stupid things that I saw and experienced every day. This is one of the world's most preeminent roboticists. So it's no mystery why, as humans, we are questioning whether these technologies can evolve to support us. And the politicians around us are saying, hmm, from a regulatory perspective, how do I control or how do I manage this? It's not just in the US, it's in the EU, it's in every country within Europe. And it also stems over to Asia. So my colleague, Missy Cummings, a couple uh, months ago, published a really nice piece um, on what self-driving cars tell us about AI risks. Human errors in operation, get replaced by human errors in coding. No mystery, humans make mistakes. The error is human. AI failures are often hard to predict, whether that's in robots on the road or that's in AI systems in the lab or in production. Probabilistic estimates do not approximate judgments under uncertainty. Managing AI, look again, is more or just as important as building AI. Think about that. We invest a billion dollars in building an AI system, and we need to invest a billion dollars or more in managing that AI system. When we think about investments, we also think about the investments of building the platform. I look at the auto industry right now, building more complex AI platforms and vehicles, and have no perception forward into the investment and the management of that platform over its duty cycle. What we think about cybersecurity vulnerabilities today, that has nothing to do with what cybersecurity vulnerabilities could be in 10 years, but this car is still going to be traversing the roads of the world. AI has system impl level implications that just can't be ignored. So, you know, the great thing about AI in some sense is we can also pull the plug. We can shut down the system. We shut down the cars. If we fail, the consumer perceptions of that will impact generations to come. So it is, as some of you know, I sit on an advisory board for the US Department of Transportation. I'm involved in many conversations globally around societal questions around AI. And in no particular order, these societal questions are huge, giant mountains. The fear of the unknown is driving political implications globally. We don't know what to assume. Politicians and their aides many times don't have the education to understand and question. Biases, security, replicability, data ownership, questionable use, male actors, workforce impacts, Decision support versus decision replacement, life or death decisions are all topics that we can spend hours, if not days, if not months, if not years talking about. Think about some of what has come out in the last few months. The US policies towards AI are evolving, limiting the benefit of some of the AI systems that we developed just a year or two ago. Sam Altman coming out the World Economic Forum AI should not be making life or death decisions. Hmm. 
as, as a society, as a country in Europe, as a country in the United States or Asia. These are societal decisions that we need to get our hands around. Biases dominate the news, dominate discussions. But you know what? Maybe bias models are really okay at times. Long ago, we would develop a bias model for a reason. If we want to understand how, how women make decisions, understanding a bias model on women may make sense. The question is not whether the model is biased or not. The model is what is the application for? How is it supposed to be transparent? Where is it supposed to be used? Key being here is that there are calls for bias. There are calls against bias, and we as a society need to understand these. Workforce impacts are huge topic of discussion globally among many different societies in the world. Security, conversation this morning. So we can go on and on here, and unfortunately, Mott's only giving me 20 or 25 minutes, so you know I better limit this conversation a little bit. But I'll challenge this group to think a bit. And one of the things that I think the folks need to think a little bit about here is how, as a community, we begin to balance the needs and the risks and the rewards of AI. Because unless we balance these together as humans, we're just not going to take the risks we probably should in certain situations. In other situations, we're going to take too much risk. So it all becomes a balance. And we very rarely step back, step up a level, and think about that balance. Okay? We can think about it edge cases to start. In AI systems, there always are going to be edge cases that were outside of the engineering assumptions of the model that, in certain instances, will create brittleness. That's not necessarily a bad thing, but it's something we have to appreciate and balance the risks and the rewards between. Automation has changed the nature of work and will continue to. Careful planning will enable new opportunities. Many of us don't drive manual transmissions anymore. Why? Because automation automated the process of shifting vehicles. It's not a problem. Automation has also changed education. It's changed how we do research. We talked about this morning about how you would never build a machine learning model from scratch anymore. It's, it's good. Not a bad thing. It's just changed the nature of work, and we have to learn to think about probabilistically predicting how it may change work in the future and then adapting to those probabilities. Misuse and overuse of technology, whether it's AI or other, doesn't necessarily call for regulation to prevent innovation for the foreseeable future, if not ever. It may actually call for more guardrails. How do we ensure we are being responsible actors today, tomorrow, and next week, but not, not limiting our innovation for decades, if not centuries to come? It's much easier for the regulatory world to shut down innovation than it is to strategically encourage it through reasonable and reputable methods. We should have seen guardrails around the development of automation technology on our roads enacted years ago. But there is so much fear in the market and incapability of our regulatory systems to adapt to evolving technology it never happened. And that's what's probably helped accelerate the demise of the automated vehicle space in the US and, and many other global economies. Thinking about how do we just move towards responsible development. Any lawyers in the room? Folks with backgrounds in legal? Hmm, I see smiles here. Look, liability is going to shift from the user to the developer. The only question is how. Corporations are going to hold long-term liability around their development decisions. There was a chatbot um, story out of Canada a few weeks ago, or a few months ago at this point, where an individual um, trying to fly uh, an bereavement ticket was provided false information by the chatbot, and the airline was held liable and responsible. You know, interesting case study, but that's going to happen more and more. And for fi finally, Society is really probably not ready for AI systems without human oversight to make big picture decisions. We will get there, but it is an evolution 
not a revolution of how automation impacts us. I'm not saying we want to slow down and crawl and we don't want to move. What I am saying is that we have to move the populace along with us. If we overstep our bounds of what people are comfortable with, we will actually end up taking longer to get to the end game of where we'd like to go. So I'm going to give the folks a few things to think about here because Mott's challenged me to, to be forward provocative and, 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 and and to challenge common thought. So how about we th start thinking about prioritizing AI that supports or augments human capabilities versus replacing human intelligence? What does this mean? This means we can think about new methods versus applications. Tools sitting on the shelf and try to invest a little more in applying those tools as opposed to creating new tools tomorrow. Black box versus open box. How do we begin to get beyond hiding what the training data was and developing and devising new ways of disclosing the training data and the methods? Optimize versus robust. Google Maps today provides me less useful navigation information than it did five years ago. It tries to hyper-optimize the route, often taking me off exits to save a few seconds which ends up, if traffic dynamics don't move properly, costing me a few minutes. So thinking about the robustness of a design versus the optimization of a design. As I said earlier, decision support versus decision replacement. As much as I believe that at some point, well beyond my lifetime, artificial general intelligence will take over, for the foreseeable future, we as humans are a key component of the equation. Central compute versus distributed. Network limitations will be here. Distributed compute, edge learning has continued and even more promise. Artificial and general intelligence versus human-centered. How do we use the technology to support humankind as opposed to why are we enamored with replacing humankind? Building skills trust and experience with AI-driven systems can smooth and perhaps accelerate our evolution towards new systems and implementations of AI and robotics in society. A human-centered focus will help mitigate some of the fears of the unknown. We as humans hate the unknown. We're scared of it. Kids frightful of the dark. That's back in the back of our brains. It is critical that we rapidly think about augmenting these fears, increasing trust, and decreasing the roadblocks out there. So let's think about a few applications here. Humans provide opinions and hallucinate. We've all told fairy tale stories, haven't we? Why do we think AI should be any different? We programmed it. We built it. To err as humans and machines are just deviations of humans. Any of that? Um, freestyle skiers, cross country, um, ice skaters in the room? Any ice skaters in the room? If you were to go to an ice skating competition and there was only one judge to tell you how good your routine is, would you trust that? No. That's why you have three, four, five different judges all looking at it from a different opinion. No mystery. We are looking for multiple judges or jury members to try a case because everybody has a different opinion, and, and nor should we trust any AI system. If you look at sociological or psychological research, we have this thing called inner coder reliability because if you look, allow one individual to interpret something, they bring a bias to that. Look at two, three, four different opinions weighing those together. Finally, building consensus. You sit in a meeting, one opinion doesn't necessarily become the dominating factor. You're listening to different opinions trying to build a consensus approach. So thinking about this in the AI terms, maybe that's ChatGTP versus Gemini how they both produce information, synthesizing those together to try to provide a more neutral or balanced opinion. Or maybe 
That's the human versus the AI system, each having value in the equation. We also need to accept that the future may be of novice doers. Many of us in the room remember learning to write. My kids don't learn cursive writing anymore. No time, no interest. They type. Is that good or bad? Think about today, we write. Think about tomorrow, we ask ChatGTP to provide us a draft edit from. Where is this okay? Where do we need to shy away from this? AI will erode fundamentally what was once core human skills. That might be okay. We need to think about where that's okay and where that's not okay. And we got to think about what new skills AI will develop in us. Well, what's one of those skills? Trying to understand and build a model of where AI may be hallucinating and where it's not. That's no difference from, from understanding where a human would hallucinate and where it's not. Building the trust model and which of our neighbors, which of our friends we are willing to trust. We can't avoid this. We need to embrace it. We need to leverage this change to think forward. If we don't embrace it, we won't involve. But we need to look at the guardrails required to think forward. So building trust in AI and the evolving systems around it may be the critical component to thinking forward. Transparency is king. Trust is built over time and eroded very quickly. But when I understand what is going on, I am much more likely to build my trust in the system. First impressions matter hugely. If I like it, how it feels, how it touches, I'll invest my time to learn and leverage it. If it's fearful, I'll shy away. Under-promising, over-delivering, the model of Honda. Folks are excited and delighted by something that performs better than their expectations. It triggers us to invest time and resources to understand. Biases can't be eliminated. They need to be acknowledged, perhaps tracked, improved over time, but that's okay. We have to start somewhere and we need to evolve from that. We gotta be transparent about it. Network limitations will probably always be the limiting factor. Our ability, our logistics capability of moving stuff, whether it's through pipelines, whether it's through wires. Moving information has huge costs. So that means that edge computing, edge learning are all areas we should be thinking about of how do you leave the information where it is and leverage it. Sustainability. An important global topic cannot be ignored. There are energy costs, there are decisions, and there are times where those are absolutely warranted. But there are times where we need to be also thinking about the waste that we are triggering. There is a glut of cell phones now in a recycling problem in the world because we all, quite frankly, want newer ones faster. How do we deal with some of this? We're, we're creating the same model with battery electric vehicles at the moment. So the challenge looking forward is really a new mindset where we effectively match problems, the tools we have to build solutions. There are absolutely areas of innovation that especially demand where the private sector and the public sector work together. To optimally, sustainably, and efficiently harness the power of change. Change isn't easy. We as humans are creatures of habit. We don't really like to change quickly. We need to be incentivized to at times. We need to find reasons to evolve. But we will achieve far more if we accept that the softer side of science, how we as humans interact with all of this, consumer interest, is probably more important than the algorithmic and the data side of science. Unless there is a market, there is no need for a product. So the difficulty here is really in finding the right balance between humans and machines, societal benefits and self-interests. 
We all want to be put first, but at the end of the day, societal interests need to be balanced in. To build the stakeholders and support network to ensure that the right tools are used for the right problems and the right reasons. These are very difficult topics to touch on because we all have self-interests. We all want certain things. But how do we balance that with the societal side? You know, bringing this back to my bread and butter and driving, we all like to move in our own car, but societally, we should be put together for efficiency purposes. Steel on steel rail is the most efficient way to move people, cargo. But yet, how many of us have flown between Gothenburg and Stockholm? So parting thought here. Given that a random advisor of any category picked off the street, is equally likely to provide you above and below average advice. One's got to begin to ponder. When should we replace professional or non-professional advice with AI? Under what conditions are we best served to leverage and weigh the advice of AI? And how can we trust this over time? So I'm going to make a, a, a financial position decision here and ask all of you to think about this. You're going to invest a couple hundred dollars couple thousand dollars. And you're going to go out and find an advisor to help you do that. Do we trust that that advisor is going to provide you above average results? Or might that advisor provide you below average results? The AI that exists today is probably going to give you an above average answer. Where should that be weighted? We all go to the doctor. There's great doctors. There's not as good doctors. The AI is probably better than the average doctor. Where should we be weighting this decision? How should it influence our decisions on advice in the future? Where should we begin to trust the AI? How should we weight that with the expertise? We can think about radiology as a great example here. Radiology has domain, has integrated vast amounts of computer vision with human expertise to provide a more robust solution to detection of abnormalities in imagery. It's not and has never said that we are going to do best by leveraging vision alone, or said we have to stay with the tried and true of history and medical experience. It's probably about the medical domain that's done the best over the last 10 to 15 years of integrating the two. And that is the challenge that I lead this audience with here. How do we leverage AI and human expertise together to begin innovating forward? And with that, if time allows, I'll answer any questions. It's on? No? Yeah, it's on. Thank you so much, Brian, and uh, so many thoughts that pops into my mind that we need to discuss later, awesome. because uh, that is time. what we'll do. <laughs> no, that's fine. But uh, we have the mingle session afterwards, so all of you will be able to talk to Brian and the rest of the board and the rest of the speakers. And uh, we hope that you take this opportunity, uh, because I I'm sure that you also have some new thoughts after this inspiring presentation. So now we're going to shift focus and uh, talk a bit about AI labs and how we advance the decentralized learning. My name is Helena Tjander and I'm Associate Director to Mats at AI labs. And um, we will start by showing you a film on what federated learning is. To train AI, you need a lot of data and repetition. Take this hospital as an example. Data from devices, journals, decisions, and tests can be used to train AI and save lives. But data from only one hospital is way too narrow to train a good AI model, and we're not allowed to move or share data from different hospitals. There are three main reasons why we can't move or share data. Regulations on data transfer or commercial confidentiality. Large volumes of data make transfer and storage costly and complicated. 
opinions, activities, or other sensitive information can jeopardize people's privacy. Decentralized learning solves this. Now we can do things with AI that just weren't possible before. Without compromising, sharing, or moving data, we move the AI to the data, train on different local data, bring back only the insights from training, merge all the insights to form a better AI model, and send that back out for further training. Cars can learn from each other and make traffic safer. AI and satellites can learn to better spot forest fires, flooding, or deforestation. Back at our hospital, better AI models can make better diagnoses and save lives. This is why we built the one-of-a-kind Edge Learning Lab here at AI Sweden, together with our partners. In this lab, we learn together and accelerate innovation by trying new ideas and developing techniques for decentralized learning. Great. I think that this film not just only show what federated learning is, but also show the essence of what Mats was talking about the, uh, before, that we invest together and share with many. And together we use this platform and uh, co-create pre-competitive, build our learnings, build our strength. And we like to see it as a gym. By being a partner to AS Sweden, you have your membership, but coming here, learning together, training together, you become stronger and doing it faster. And that's what we're all about. So we started uh, three and a half years ago, I think, to build this uh, infrastructure, starting off with uh, investments from uh, Sensac, Volvo Cars, and HP, and building the learnings in mobility sector. And shortly after that, we started in the health sector, together with the regions of uh, Västra Götaland and Halland, continuing into uh, space sector by uh, arranging a collaborathon where we gain insights in what direction we could use federated learning in space. And shortly after that, we also went into finance, uh, and uh, we're going to hear more about that later, but... Uh, working on anti-laundry laundering, for instance. Uh, using the same kind of technology in all these areas is a great way to move faster. And um, from the very start, we also worked in the, the cybersecurity or AI security area due to that our prominent advisors told us that this is an area that you really need to work with and I think that this is also some area where we are going to move forward a lot the coming year and uh, we have a lot of interesting things coming up in that area. When we talk about AI security it's both AI enhanced security and AI safety or securing AI where AI enhanced security is to use AI to, uh, to strengthen or improving the existing systems that we have, while uh, AI safety is preventing AI from doing the wrong things in learning or doing or presenting things. So those are the two different parts of AI security that we work on. And now, uh, with this short introduction, I will leave the floor to Johan Östman, one of our research engineers who are managing several of the project projects within the security area, both in AI and all security and AI safety. And uh, we are also going to hear a lot of presentations on uh, the other areas after Yuan. But Yuan, please come up. The stage is yours. Wow. Thanks for that. Um, and thank you, Helena, for introducing me. Um, so I'm going to take 10 minutes of your time to talk about two major initiatives at AI Sweden that we are working towards. And I think one of them would classify into this AI security that Helena was uh, talking about. And the other one is probably, with a little bit of imagination, um, classified into the other leg about enhanced uh, 
uh, security via AI. Um, I'm going to focus on AI security uh, to begin with. And <clears throat> as Helena said, just iterating a bit, um, we view AI security as uh, a way to prevent AI from doing what it's not supposed to. Could be uh, some action that it should not perform, or as I will talk more about now, to not reveal what it's not supposed to reveal. Uh, this is, of course, something that has been highlighted in many instances, for example, by the uh, US Cyber Command and Director at NSA. And last year in March, about exactly a year ago, uh, the US released a strategy, uh, a national strategy, uh, where they actually pinpoint the issues of uh, information leakage and attacks on AI systems. And in that report, interestingly, they uh, outline several techniques that uh, they need to gather resources around, that they need to build knowledge around, and that they need to understand better. You see that table here. Some of these um, topics are uh, something that has already been, already been mentioned uh, by Brian and by Helena, for example, federated learning, um, synthetic data, differential privacy might occur from time to time. Um, and I'm going to get back to this table in this presentation just to show you how we actually cover some of these aspects. Not all of them, but many of them. Um, but yeah, as I said, this uh, problem of information leakage of uh, machine learning models, essentially having machine learning models spit out information that they have been exposed to during training, is something that um, many different countries are thinking about. US is one, as I said. Uh, Britain. Um, we have Germany has released a report on uh, concerns about attacks on AI systems. And even in Sweden, we have done some works on this. For, so for example, IME, the um, authority for data privacy in Sweden, it was founded uh, when GDPR came about, uh, have done, uh, so they have something called regulatory pilots. Uh, and um, they uh, essentially engage in innovation projects and try to view um, whatever you, uh, you're trying to innovate from a legal perspective. Um, and they did this in their first uh, regulatory sandbox on federated learning and came to the conclusion that due to the effect that we can potentially attack these systems, federated learning when we share models between each other can be viewed as a poor way of communicating because you can extract information and hence, if it's sensitive data, you might be violating uh, laws. Um, for this reason, uh, we have uh, started to dig deeper, and we are looking into a very abstract way of um, leaking information. And I just want to guide you through what that might look like in one uh, instance. So here we have a typical attack on an AI system. You might be familiar with this API access of AI systems. Think about ChatGPT. So we have a data set that is very sensitive. We train a model on it. We take the trained model, we expose it to external parties, could be a customer, could be other companies, whatever, via an API. So the user can only interact with the model by providing an input and retrieving an output. Now, if this user that is interacting with the machine learning model has ill intentions, then potentially you could tailor the input queries according to some objective, read out the output predictions for that query, and forge an understanding about the training data that the model has been exposed to. It sounds exotic, but this is very much possible and has, has been demonstrated over the last five years. So it's a fairly new uh, research area, but it's something that is uh, really picking up now and it's becoming quite hot, I would say. So just to give an example, this is an attack that we have implemented on uh, federated learning. As an adversary, you essentially start from a random guess. I believe that this training, this data point is in the training data set. And now by interacting with the model that you have received at the server side, you can refine this guess. And after a bunch of iterations, you end up with something that might actually look reminiscent of something that you can identify. In this case, this is a toy example of CIFAR. You can do this on more sophisticated data sets as well. But here, the ground truth looks like this, and you can see that you can really tell that it's a red car. And of course, you can apply this to faces or whatever personal information that might be around. The problem, though, is that these types of attacks typically make very crucial assumptions. They make assumptions on the way that the model is trained. They make assumptions on, for example, the batch size, the epochs, a bunch of parameters. So you can only 
really perform these attacks under very, very limited uh, scenarios. And the question then is, how realistic are these scenarios where these attacks are potent? And this is what we are investigating. So we created a project that we call LeakPro, stands for Leakage Profiling and Risk Oversight of Machine Learning Models. We gathered a consortium within the AI Sweden partner network, consisting of uh, technical leaders within federated learning like Scaleout and synthetic data like Syndata, and also uh, major players within life science like Solgenska, um, Region Holland, and AstraZeneca. And we teamed up to define use cases that we would be interested in understanding would we be at risk of leaking data. And we are trying to build a general platform that will stress test machine learning models. And coming back to this table then, so these are all the technologies that uh, the US outlined, or that uh, this uh, uh, committee outlined that were important. And what we're in investigating in LeakPro are essentially these. So we leave a few of these out because the pro project is very large in scope. But we are touching on a lot of these um, aspects, um, which I believe is very interesting. So the goal of uh, LeakPro is essentially to provide an open source platform to stress test machine learning models. We are extremely interested in step, taking a step away from the academic sandbox, where we only have toy examples, very you know, easy uh, or very, very limited scenarios that we can attack under. And we really care about what are realistic assumptions can we attack, attack under these realistic assumptions? So the goal is to consider four different scenarios. We have black box attacks, where we can only query and receive an output. We have white box attacks, for example, I think Llama 3, that was released a few days ago, where we can actually access the entire model. We look at th synthetic data. How much can we say about the original data if we have access to the synthetic? And we look at federated learning. So if we have a server that is trying to attack the training procedure of a given client, how potent is it? And from my point of view, the most interesting part of this project is really not the technical aspects. It's interesting in itself, but the most interesting part is this interface. This interface is an interface between technical risk and legal risk. And this is a bridge that is very, very tricky to uh, traverse. So we have a reference group consisting of EMI, ESAM, um, and lawyers from AI Sweden. We have Region Halland pro providing uh, legal expertise. And recently, we even extended the group to include four more organizations where we discussed solely around what do you need from a technical perspective to reason around privacy risks in AI from a legal perspective? How can we make this discussion move forward? So that's very exciting, I think. And the goal, of course, is then to provide this kind of uh, uh, material to lawyers, provide some time kind of auditing trail for how you train models, and then in the end, hopefully get some kind of approval that this model, we believe, will not risk any information that is sensitive. And if we are able to do this and provide such uh, approval so we can start using federated learning in practice on sensitive data, it opens up a plethora of new applications that we can actually, uh, where we can improve current state of uh, uh, performance. For example, one such setting is uh, within money laundering. So money laundering is a very, very good use case for federated learning. We have multiple banks that are obliged to monitor the transaction networks to find uh, illicit transactions. Due to bank secrecy, they are not allowed to share any information between each other, but potentially the uh, surveillance systems might get a large boost and improvement if they were allowed to collaborate. So this is a very simplified view of the problem. We essentially have a transaction network at one bank. We um, have some accounts in the bank that are illicit. And of course, we would like to find them. In this case, it might be very easy. But this transaction network is enormous, and it's developing over time. So we have dynamic graphs. And we have created a synthetic data engine to mimic this transaction network. So just to give you a feeling for how tricky it is, uh, I can show you a small network that we created to play around with that looks like this. All the uh, clusters that you see here are different banks. The red, the black edges are transactions. 
all the red dots are money launderers. We would like to identify them. It's like finding a needle in a haystack. It's extremely tricky. And as I said, today, banks are operating like this. So they have access to the local transaction networks. They perform the surveillance on there. But of course, transactions go between banks. So the question is, how can we actually leverage that? And what we are trying to do in this project, together with Swedbank and Handelsbanken, is to actually investigate, is there powers in numbers? Can we collaborate on this problem to create better systems to combat money laundering? So we are trying to build something like this. Uh, this project has been going on for a year, and we are right now starting to actually train federated models between Handelsbank and Swedbank, AI Sweden in the middle, on the synthetic data that we have cross-validated towards real transaction data to show that we actually will be able to uh, boost the performance of current systems. All right, so if any of these topics uh, sounds interesting to you, um, I would like to invite you to come by uh, the posters that we have created to uh, discuss this in more detail. The first poster is about the information leakage, and then we have three more posters, where one of them is about the federated aspect of money laundering, and two, uh, the two in the middle here are actually um, posters that are going to be presented by our master's students that are working on uh, very similar topic, or working on the same topic, but from a different perspective. One of them are looking, one of the master thesis uh, project is looking at uh, how much does unreliable labels impact the uh, performance of money laundering surveillance systems, whereas the other poster is going to uh, focus on if we flag an account as a money launderer, how can we explain to an investigator why we actually did so? So explainable methods on graph data that is moving with time. And with that said, uh, I'm not going to take more of your time. Uh, I would like to um, ask Chiara to come up and talk a little bit about what is happening within uh, space. Thank you. Hi. Uh, my name is Chiara Ciocobello, and I work as a data scientist at AI Sweden but I'm also the coordinator of uh, AI Sweden's uh, space activities. So I'm going to talk about that today, especially given the uh, particular focus of this meeting, I will focus on, of course, on the activities that are uh, centered on uh, decentralized AI. But why space? Well, I think uh, you're always witnessing, uh, as I am, uh, the exponential growth of uh, the global space economy. Uh, and we can see that by the increasingly large number of satellites that are launched every year, uh, as you can tell here. And this is due to the fact that the cost of manufacturing and launching of uh, satellites has been uh, plummeting. So uh, we are now uh, yeah, having entire constellations of satellites going around Earth. And then, of course, is uh, the, perf the perfect... Uh, ground for us to study and investigate how decentralized learning can be used in this um, kind of circumstances and in the space domain. Now, if you think about uh, the, um, like every single dot, uh, we can look at it from the perspective of the data generation. So if we think about, uh, for instance, Copernicus Sentinel-2 satellite, which is one of the most well-known uh, satellites that collects images of Earth, uh, well, Sentinel-2 takes about 20,000 images of Earth every five days, which accounts to 1.6 million per year. So this is a, we are talking about big data. And if you think that each dot is more or less uh, collecting the same amount of data, you see that we have, uh, well, a problem in the sense that uh, this data has to be moved around in order to be analyzed. And this is a very complex type of data that requires um, pretty heavy pre-processing uh, before even you can get to do anything with it. However, uh, because we have so much, uh, this, uh, this data has invaluable uh, value for uh, many different kinds of fields. So we can use it to um, 
to get information about climate. We can uh, uh, use it to, for navigation, for satellite communication, for uh, monitoring of um, um, land use, uh, water, uh, forests, uh, and so on. So it is really um, uh, a source of knowledge that we really that we want to harness as best as we can. Um, however, uh, like I said. Um, the, um, the there exists a very big problem that is only going to get worse with time. Uh, the data has to be uh, moved primarily uh, either uh, from the ground truth to the satellite in terms of commands and things like that, or back to the ground when we want to actually download data. And also we want to ideally also communicate between satellites depending on what we want to do with them. And if you look at the uh, full electromagnet, uh, full radio spectrum, then you see that there is only a very little band that can be used that is um, um, uh, given for satellite communication. And within that, only just very, very little bands are um, given for satellite communication. So um, you see that, like, if we uh, send in orbit many more satellites, we soon will get to a point in which we have a problem with communication that is very serious. So we want to be to become very efficient in doing so. And as we um, as we heard uh, so far, um, we can maybe use the centralized AI to partially um, postpone this problem uh, at least and, uh, and try and see if we can uh, be better at it. We can use all the knowledge that um, we can gather here, for instance, at AI Sweden, from other, all the other fields that we are working on with the same type of technology and see how we can use that in the space domain as well. And um, we heard just now that even when you have a lot of clients interacting with each other that do a lot of transactions, they are like um, uh, they vary over time, like for instance, satellites that don't see each other all the time or they don't see the ground station. Uh, at any moment can be um, as well transferred. Uh, so, and that what is uh, that is our goal. Uh, it is actually uh, one of the main uh, focus that we have here in uh, one of the project that we are um, uh, that we have. Oh, what? <laughs> sorry, here that we have together with Unibap, which is a company that develops hardware and uh, software for um, setting up uh, space-based application on board of satellites and help the, them set up uh, smoothly and, uh, and maintaining them and operating them. Um, this project is financed by Rim Stevenson and uh, together with that and uh, the uh, enormous help of like young talents and uh, my colleague Rasmus and uh, another from uh, AI Sweden, we are testing a number of models that are um, suitable for many different types of applications, like, uh, for instance, uh, uh, change detection or like monitoring of forest uh, um, or uh, cloud detection and even uh, uh, space interferometry. Um, so what we are doing is um, uh, testing this AI, different AI models in, uh, on, in the lab here on uh, uh, the Unibuff machines and see how the, would they uh, interact with each other if we set up uh, like the AI training and in, in, uh, inference like on um, the centralized setup. In order to uh, be as realistic as possible, uh, we are also using a tool that we developed uh, with ESA uh, last year. Uh, which is called Paseos, and it's uh, a simulation tool that um, that uh, simulates uh, multiple sp spacecraft orbiting um, uh, at the same time and exchanging information, o uh, optimizing uh, both well, studying power consumption and trying to optimize communication between them. So, um, what we we are using this tool to, uh, like, in conjunction with several different kinds of uh, models to see what we can do about it. Then, uh, as an overarching space project, I would say, especially focused on the Swedish uh, space data uh, users community, 
Uh, we have a project that is uh, ongoing since 2019, um, of which uh, AI Sweden has been one of the core uh, components since the beginning. And it is um, uh, financed by uh, Vinova. The goal of this uh, project is to um, decrease, uh, lower the barrier uh, for uh, spaces uh, usage. So what we want to do is to um, create um, data ready, um, analysis ready data, so that we can um, provide them to a broader community that, that don't need to, uh, that doesn't need to um, do these steps um, individually. And, um, and by that, uh, by doing that, we hope that more, um, that more users will, will be joining this community and we can have like a much better connection and a lot of use cases uh, to work on. Most of the apps that are um, developed under this uh, type of project, but specifically also this one, uh, are, um, uh, are focused on, um, uh, are using uh, decentralized AI. And among them, uh, we picked two that you might be interested in. Um, and we created these two posters. And when I say we, I intend me and Rasmus, who is going to talk uh, just right after me. Uh, one is uh, uh, is the one in which we, it is, like say, um, uh, focused on uh, a specific technique for astronomy that is called space interferometry, where uh, we we aim at re reconstructing a sky model uh, using AI and a decentralized uh, a decentralized learning setup. While the other one is um, in collaboration with um, uh, with ESA and the University of Cambridge and the UNIBAP, also, uh, of course, where we uh, want to uh, test um, a smaller version of the segment anything uh, type of model. So we want to um, um, do image segmentation uh, with a very lightweight uh, model, also on board of satellite, and uh, and benchmark as well the power consumption and so on that we. Uh, that we will end up having uh, with the with the use of this model. Yes, so um, this was it. Uh, I really hope that you are a little bit curious about what we do in space, and so please come and uh, talk to us. Um, we will send him uh, close to the posters. Thank you. And yeah, now I'm leaving it to Rasmus. Thank you. Uh, so my name is Rasmus. I'm a research engineer here at AI Sweden, focusing on decentralized learning for space and mobility. Uh, but today I will be giving you a brief presentation of one of our current projects focusing on federated learning for autonomous vehicles. So uh, in the last couple of centuries, uh, uh, <laughs> not the centuries, but 10, 20 years, we have seen a huge development in embedded resources and systems and electrifications of vehicles, uh, specifically cars. Uh, and these cars are now becoming more and more digitized, equipped with uh, complex arrays of sensors, cameras, and onboard resources for compute and uh, storage tasks. And playing an integral part of our daily life, um, and also for across industries, cars are becoming more and more prominent for and potent for collecting vast amounts of data of our everyday life across streets and more. And with this data, we get unique opportunities for training more complex models that can help us in the development of future drive solutions. Of course, uh, doing so, we also need to find a new, new type of balance between having a lot of data in order to get better models, get diverse models from using data across nations or uh, across actors, but we also need to find out how much data we actually can manage with a uh, feasible amount of resources and how to preserve privacy and not disclosing any sensitive information. So uh, today, most of these AI models in autonomous vehicles are trained more using centralized pipelines. Uh, and as you all maybe know, then in this case, uh, the vehicles collect images using these sensors and onboard cameras where the uh, data is then transferred to more centralized hubs uh, for storage and compute. Uh, and here we usually see the integration of supercomputing facilities in order to facilitate the training process. However, this method also uh, is seen now uh, approaching a lot more challenges uh, with respect to current and expected regulatory shifts in 
data transfer, especially international data transfer, but also data collection and privacy preserving. Uh, and managing these amounts of data is also very complex uh, since it, it, it requires tight integration between different infrastructure across actors and across nations, uh, which can induce costs and latency. But another way of doing this is using federated learning. So as you've seen in the previous presentations and also in the video, uh, the core concept here is to move the modeling uh, or the model and the training of the model to the actual edge of the system, in this case being the vehicles. Uh, so in this case, we train the models uh, on board vehicles using locally captured data. So we get very specialized trained models on board the vehicles. But the case here is a bit interesting when we speak about autonomous vehicles because we also need to evaluate how, the tr how much uh, of computational resources that the training actually requires to do this on board, and if, uh, if and how this cooperates and interferes with other critical driver or safety-related systems. Uh, so in this case, maybe it would be more feasible if the uh, cars actually do the onboard training while the car is not actually in uh, motion. Uh, so this creates unique windows of opportunity for scheduling training, much like how we do or, or how we see the communication uh, constraints when we evaluate the application of space, or like satellites in orbit around space. Uh, but in this case, uh, they do the onboard training, and whenever they are ready, uh, they can then establish a connection to a centralized hub and move the model improvements rather than the actual collected images or sensor data in order to be federated into a global model that can then be redistributed to the system for further training. So in this case, we can then uh, take, make the benefits of local specialized models while also getting more uh, generalized models from the global aggregation. So by relocating the training of AI models to the vehicles themselves, we can ensure a more uh, data privacy preserving mode of training since we only communicate the model improvements rather than the actual images captured by these uh, vehicles across the streets or, uh, or different places. Uh, but we're also able to minimize the, uh, the storage cost and optimize the use of compute since we're now able to leverage uh, the onboard resources from thousands of vehicles uh, rather than having to be reliant on supercomputing facilities. Uh, and with these privacy preserving and also the use of uh, distributed agents with limited or embedded resources, we can also be able to manage these huge quantities of data, uh, benefiting from data from across borders or across actors, improving models and getting more diversity and general performance. So in this project, we aim to develop the edge learning technology to a level where it's ready to use for training uh, AI models on board autonomous vehicles. And the idea here is to uh, develop a framework uh, that is both flexible and robust. Uh, it should be library agnostic with respect to federated learning schemes, uh, use standardized communication protocols, which is quite new in this field, and also uh, be scalable for future applications and drive solutions. Uh, and this framework will also be very essential for the participating companies since it will enable them to define how to tightly integrate the federated learning system into current drive chains or drive solutions. Uh, it will also be uh, very critical for uh, finding out what type of hardware and requirements on data storage that is needed for doing this federated learning scheme. And it will also enable the companies to define and develop AI models that can actually uh, benefit and make use of the centralized uh, approaches. And uh, working on this project, we're mainly three companies under uh, a funding program of Vinova. And uh, at the core of this project, like all of our projects at AI Sweden, we're also working towards the UN uh, sustainability goals. Uh, and where we see a lot of different applications, but most pro uh, prominent being the efficient use of uh, resources across the vehicles uh, and unique learning capabilities for future research. So taking a bit more deeper look into how we actually develop this framework, we start with a system setup with a hardware in loop uh, environment using the edge learning lab. And this is a very critical point since we're able now to use the, the centralized learning systems on board the uh, edge lab. Uh, while also implementing it with uh, industry-grade equipment. So in this case, we can actually simulate a more realistic onboard scenario uh, of a vehicle. 
and this is uh, also a very unique uh, opportunity and uh, makes, us, uh, makes it possible to develop an initial architecture of this framework. Uh, the next step is scaling. So uh, we move from simulating a single vehicle to actually using multiple compute nodes in the same hardware in the loop environment, uh, but now simulating fleets of vehicles to see what key challenges are here to be met and uh, accounted for when considering uh, multiple compute nodes. And the third phase of this project is uh, especially interesting, and this is also where we are today, where we're taking a big leap moving the framework from uh, the Edge Learning Lab to a more realistic in infrastructure uh, based on Senseact's development fleet. So in this case, we're moving the framework on board the vehicle to evaluate how uh, the training of these AI models and the requirements of compute and local storage interacts with all of these safety and driver-related systems. And the last step, hopefully, there we go. Uh, the last step will be scaling again, uh, where we consider doing federated learning across several vehicles uh, and representing a smaller fleet. And this will also be extremely interesting because this is, will be uh, one of the first uh, real life applications and evaluations on board vehicles using locally captured data and longer time sequences. And to work on this model uh, and or framework, we're using a verification uh, process uh, based on the holistic path model, which predicts the drivable path of the vehicle uh, and using only images uh, captured by the, ca uh, the cameras and sensors. And the output is th then the predicted path. Uh, and we can train this using Sensec Open Dataset, which is a large mo multimodal dataset with thousands of images and sensor data. Uh, but also high precision GPS and various other technologies that enables us to develop a, uh, or uh, derive a ground truth of where the car was actually driving and where the drivable paths are uh, in the scene. But of course, as all of our projects here at AI Sweden, we're also aiming to generalize the know-how and the uh, experience that we gain in this project to be applicable across various applications in different fields or industries. Uh, and uh, this is something very interesting since we're now dealing essentially with a system of distributed agents with embedded resources. Uh, and this is something you can see, especially in healthcare, banking, and in space. Uh, so we aim to share our knowledge, but also uh, gain insights from the other projects to further develop this uh, tool for uh, the future of transportation on, on board autonomous vehicles. And that's all. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Max Petron. I work here at AS Sweden. And uh, one of my responsibilities is uh, taking care of our test bed here. Uh, and I'd like you to invite you all to uh, take the opportunity and actually visit it in real life. And it will be organized here by my lovely colleague, Ted. And it will be on a poster outside where you can get around and taking a walk upstairs to see the real stuff. I was involved in this project uh, with this uh, short and catchy name, uh, Next Generation Infrastructure for Foundation Models. And it's all about big foundation models, like big language models. Uh, we see some uh, issues, or no, not issues, but some uh, challenges, uh, how it's trained today that you need to have a centralized, uh, more or less data center size uh, environment to train it. And the entire uh, system should be more or less the same version and flavor. So it's quite homogeneous environment you need. And you need, of course, lots of data. Uh, the problem here is that all the data, as you had heard several times now, uh, cannot be moved due to many reasons, uh, legislations, uh, cost, pure will, IP uh, stuff. Uh, so therefore, yeah, 
So even if everyone wants to have a huge data center to train on, um, not many organizations has the resources or capability of setting up those. And it costs a lot of uh, hiring them um, or paying for time to spend on those exists. Uh, and of course, like I said, you cannot use all, all data. We believe that we can take a little bit more dense decentralized approach, uh, especially for a, a decentralized society as Sweden. Uh, we think that you need to do it. Um, that means that we move the training to the data. Um, but also that the training here is maybe not uh, the, the foundation model by itself to train it up, but more or less of fine tuning it. Then you can move it to the data and make it more fit for the purpose. Uh, and you can use the already existing infrastructure um, if it exists up there, but then we need also need to have support of doing it on a heterogeneous environment. Um, but that gives us, of course, a return of investment. So we can use already existing uh, equipment up there. Uh, so we believe the approach here will be that we have an orchestrator that orchestrated the fine tuning workloads out to the uh, different environment that exists. Uh, and we're doing this together with uh, many, for several global tech like Intel, that is one of the, was with us from the beginning, and uh, also small, small or medium sized or companies as Ixia. And we're trying to figure out how to do it and how should the infrastructure support this methodology. And if you want more, more details, I will be out there in the post session. So please come and reach out. That was a quick version. I will give over to Magnus to talk about health. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me to present uh, a small project we had on federated learning a couple of years ago in the healthcare sector. Um, uh, so I'm Magnus Schelber. I'm heading the AI Competence Center at Salgens University Hospital, which is located here in Gothenburg. Uh, and we had a couple of years ago, we started this project in the, in the bigger decentralized AI project together with AI Sweden, Halmstad University, and another uh, healthcare provider called Region Halland in Sweden. And as you probably saw in the, um, as you could see in the nice movie that Helena showed about sharing data in healthcare, it's quite challenging, almost impossible. Uh, so we cannot, couldn't uh, aim for this centralized approach when we wanted to, to create a joint m AI model together between the different health, two, two healthcare providers. And we then thought perhaps we should try the decentralized approach, the federated learning approach. Um, so. If we take a step back, so what is a typical AI application in healthcare? It's utilizing patient data to some extent. There are a lot of different types of data uh, produced in healthcare. Could be images, could be text, could be tabular structured data, gen genomic data, device data, etc. But in general, it's using this data to give with AI to produce personalized diagnostics, personalized treatment, personalized healthcare, more or less. That is sort of the the aim for using AI in medical applications. Um, when it comes to creating these models, it has it happens hospital per hospital at the moment. It's very, as I said, it's impossible to share data between hospitals. If you want to share, create a joint model, get a better model with more data, at the moment it's very difficult uh, and we cannot do that. Um, so the use cases we work with were medical images, dermatology images, dermatoscopic images, predicting basically skin cancer or not, malign mal melanoma. And we had another use case for tabular data from the patient journal. It's uh, assessing the risk of ample, unplanned re readmission within 30 days for heart failure patients. So two, two different use cases, two different uh, data modalities. Um, and we wanted to work first with open data sets, of course, because we will just to take this, test the technology, etc. but then move into the real, our real data sets and as a sort of uh, end point and uh, the final, final goal for this project. Um, 
so the, pro the uh, project setup was more like this, starting in back in 2021, looking at technical platforms, the federated learning frameworks and security privacy assessment of those service setups, looking at the communication between our hospitals, uh, starting with open data sets and then moving into the, the true uh, hospital, the, the real hospital data. And these were these uh, activities were performed by these four data scientists, one from Sargent, two from, no, one from Sargent University Hospital, one from Region Holland, and two from the I4AI training um, talent attraction program that AI Sweden had at that point. point. And they were located uh, with us for six months. Um, so from a technical point of view, this is the setup, very simple because there's just two pro healthcare providers, two nodes and one server located in our data center. This communication worked quite fine. I mean, from an IT point of view, I mean, healthcare IT department can be quite difficult to work with sometimes, but in our case, this was very smooth, I would say. So we made this work. We could communicate between the different hospitals. Uh, we also did uh, like a simulated test just to show the value and the sort of justification of doing federated learning and getting more data into the models. So trying to simulate uh, different sizes of hospitals, for instance, taking the 21 healthcare regions that we have in Sweden, which have different sizes. We, uh, the one here in Gothenburg, quite big one with 2 million um, inhabitants, whereas there are a lot of smaller ones and just seeing the, the benefit of the large one, but also the much more benefit of the smaller ones using federated learning. Uh, also looking at the ratio of positive negative examples and how that could affect or how those data sets could be and hospitals could be affected by using federated learning, as well as looking at the different biases in the different data sets that we could perhaps perceive could be within different from different hospitals that we see. We have different types of patients, for instance, or some other ways of working, et cetera, et cetera. But all of these were kind of positive. Um, we could see positive benefits of using federated learning in these kind of uh, simulated tests. So we have technical, from a technical point of view, fine. From a business point of view or a clinical point of view, fine, this should work. But we had one thing <laughs> lie hanging around, and that's the legal question. So, I mean, we thought that we are not sharing data, but we are sharing models based on sh sensitive data. So how, do, how can we, do we believe these models are anonymized? Uh, patient data or do we still believe that they are person data, a person data? And that is something that our legal departments couldn't really figure out. This was very hard for them to get, get their heads around. So we were very happy that we could work there with the Swedish Authority for Privacy Protection and we sit down for them with them for six months, a six month period and had a dialogue and they, this was part of their start up of uh, regulatory sandbox uh, activity. So we were the first project into that. Uh, sandbox activity uh, and after six months they up uh, and dialogue they came with a sort of guidance or conclusion uh, yeah they say it is a, it's a guidance and they said that we do not believe this is safe enough we believe that there might be leakage of person personalized uh, person information which means that we couldn't really continue we it was hard to go against this authority and still push it so we sort of finalized the project there and i, I will come back to later what we what we do afterwards but Still, I mean, from a privacy preserving point of view, I think it's important to have these kind of technologies, even though perhaps they are not 100% anonymized, it still might be worthwhile working with these technologies. So federated approaches, of course, very, very imp important. Different anonymization techniques is something we're using, aggregation, um, differential privacy. We worked quite a bit with synthetic data generation, both images, tabular data. Now we're exploring uh, large language models. Can they create like patient journals for us, synthetic patient journals, but also have secure processing environments, encryption, all these kind of techniques. We believe so that we have these kind of toolbox and I think that would be quite a good base for doing, exploiting patient data or being a little bit more aggressive when it comes to exploiting patient data. If we put all these kind of risk minimization uh, things in place. Uh, and just to finalize, so we believe this kind of federated approach is still something in, in interesting from our point of view. We, if we look out in Europe, for instance, here's a, a EU-sponsored project that we are part of about sharing um, data for rare cancers, where we are using federated approaches across different university hospitals within Europe. So we are still exploring this opportunity. Uh, and we're also happy that we are part of the Leak Pro project that Johan mentioned. I think this is really 
will be a key for us to perhaps move for forward when it comes to federated learning, the outcome of this Leak Pro project. But then there are a number of other projects where federated learning is also an important factor, not to mention the this uh, summer intern project together with uh, Dakota State University and AI Sweden, where we are also have a couple of students that will, that will be participating in this project. And by that, I thank you for your attention and uh, hand it over to Sophia Wright. Good. Magnus. Uh, so in a short while, I look forward to talking to you about how decentralized learning intersects with talent development at AI Sweden. But first, we will listen to Dr. Jose Marie Griffiths, who is the president at Dakota State University. I think this one is on. Hopefully. Yes. Yes. Thank you very much. Well, um, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, this is sort of a last minute addition to the program. So nothing was prepared, so here are my notes. Um, I, as uh, was mentioned, I'm the president at Dakota State University. For you, those of you who don't know Dakota State, we are in the middle of the United States in South Dakota. We are in a town of 7,000 people. We are a STEM-focused university, science, technology. We don't have engineering, but we do have education and mathematics. And our, our claim to fame is um, we are very, very strong in computer science, all the different aspects of cybersecurity, and then more recently we've added artificial intelligence, and we'll soon be adding um, certificates and uh, uh, programs in uh, quantum computing. So that's our, our claim to fame. Um, I came over here three and a half, four years ago um, to talk about the uh, uh, future of democracy in an AI-enabled environment, and I met Mats. And Max told me I should come and see the Edge Learning the Edge Lab. Um, and so we went to see it. And I said, that's very like one of the labs we have. And so when I went back to the United States, we got some of our, our people, our researchers, uh, and our leaders together talking with people over here. And we felt we should do something. So we decided to do this industrial immersive ex summer, summer experience that you just heard about. We started, I think we sent three or four students over, and there were th three or four students from uh, Swedish universities together, four weeks over here, and then four weeks in South Dakota, working on projects that were given to them by outside entities. Um, we got funding for our side of things from uh, Casey Holland, which makes big agricultural equipment. And um, they have, it was so, they were so positive about that first experience and what the students brought back in the way of knowledge and experience that they funded Dakota State for five years to continue this program. And this year we're sending 12 students over. So we'll have 24 students, 24, 25 students total in this summer immersive experience. The students teams uh, will have four teams um, of six students. They work on applied problems. And I am pleased to announce just this morning, I was talking with the chief of the Royal Navy and the Royal Navy is going to participate um, and give us a, a project area, which will be um, looking at uh, rapid, dif rapid data fusion uh, on, on ship movements uh, using open source intelligence, not necessarily naval ships, it could be ships just outside here. And there are two purposes really. One is to take a look at can we establish the regular routines? We've got the ferries, so we know we can establish the regular routines of the ferries. And then we've got, um, can we detect anomalies in these movements? And so beginning to look at uh, anomaly detection, which is one of the precursors for cybersecurity. Um, I just wanted to let you know, one of the uh, Swedish students who participated in last year's summer exchange is, is giving one of the poster sessions. And um, I don't know if he's here now, are you here? There he is, right at the back. Stand up for a second so people know who you are. So you can ask him questions about the, exp the experience and if you, uh, if you want to know more, you could ask him or you could ask me, and I'd be happy to tell you all about it. But thank you very much. We're very, very pleased to the Royal Navy for joining us in uh, providing an example. Thank you. Great. So it's almost time for lunch. Uh, it's just me left, and I'm Sibylle Hedian, and I am head of talent programs at AI Sweden. And 
one of the main objectives of our talent programs is to accelerate innovation through the strategic use of talents. So we believe in the power of scaling quickly and efficiently, as mentioned before here today, and working with talents makes us able to drive innovation at a pace that matches the rapid evolution of AI and technology, and also to meet our partners' needs in those matters. And I want to follow up on Jose Marie's uh, presentation on the Industrial Immersion Exchange Program, and also mention some more interesting projects that are part of our talent programs. I'm very happy that several talents are present here today, and they're eager to talk further to you about what they are doing here at AI Sweden and with our partners during the poster session. So uh, Jesper mentioned before, who was a part of the Industrial Emotion Exchange Program, will showcase a project from last summer together with Dell and HP and talk about the results that his team gathered on fine tuning and cybersecurity risks regarding federated large language models. Yes, but together with his colleague David are also pursuing their master thesis at AI Sweden, as mentioned by Yuan before. And their focus lies in pioneering the future of anti-money laundering. Their thesis uh, focuses on how noise in transactional data affects the quality of state-of-the-art machine learning models. And the thesis aims to reduce the risk of financial crimes and to increase the robustness of money laundering detection models. And Thomas and Agnes are also immersed in the anti-money laundering project at AI Sweden. And they look forward to talking about their progress on how explainable AI can be used as an enabling technology in the efforts against financial crime within the banking sector. And we have several other master thesis students here today. They're in the second to back row. And I believe that they also look forward to talking to you about their projects. They are sitting at our offices, becoming a part of the AI Sweden network and have access to expertise and the infrastructure at AI Sweden. And then I want to introduce our most recent talent program, the Next Generation AI Business Leaders. They, that program was launched this spring. And we're very excited to have students who are collaborating with our leadership team at AI Sweden. And their mission is to guide the integration of AI in organizational structures. Throughout the spring and summer, they'll be reaching out to other organizations eager to assist them in their journey of navigating the, uh, like the complexities of AI adoption. And currently, they are involved in several different projects, such as AI policy and AI security, defense innovation, AI in healthcare, and the impact of AI on the Swedish workforce. Several students from that program are also here today, looking forward to exchange ideas with you soon. So the, the projects and the programs that I've mentioned here today exemplifies the collaborative spirit and innovative drive within our talent programs. The programs take various forms and catering to different partner needs. There are several more than the ones that I have mentioned here today. We also collaborate with the universities and with other schools forms to provide hands-on experience to students, giving them a taste of real world projects and challenges. The international aspect is with us in programs with Dakota State University and an upcoming initiative with Singapore. And we really believe that talent exchange can bolster collaboration between countries. And at the heart of our vision is the belief that talent is key to driving future success. So we're committed to nurturing Sweden with the next generation of leaders and workers in AI. And by investing in talent development, we're not only securing our own future, but also contributing to the growth of the innovation of the wider industry. So 
if you are interested in learning more about talent programs and the projects that have been mentioned, these guys are super excited to talk to you uh, during the poster session, which is, has now been time for. So I will say thank you and goodbye to those who have joined online and to those of you who are present here in the room. We will go to the next room on your left-hand side and mingle and have lunch and uh, look at the posters during the poster session. And on behalf of everyone who has spoken here today and of everyone who has been organizing this event, I want to say thank you very much for joining and listening. And we look forward to talking more to you. So thank you.